Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark, and today I am joined by guest Sam Shepler. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. So for folks who maybe haven't met you before, could you tell them who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So uh, Sam Shepler, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Testimonial Hero. Uh, what we do at Testimonial Hero is we make um, highest quality video testimonials effortless. Um, so that is, you know, customer testimonial videos, employee testimonial videos, um, as well as, you know, uh, student testimonials uh, for higher ad marketing and uh, patient testimonials. Um, that being said, you know, bulk of our work is in customer testimonials. Um, and um, we do it, you know, all over the world uh, at a flat rate through a network of videographers. And we also do it purely remotely as well. Cool. Uh, that's great. So the, the, thanks for that. And I want to just share with the listener that the, the sort of starting point for this interview uh, was something you tweeted that I really liked that I'll just read real quick. Uh, this is from Sam. It says, new opportunities for seven-figure productized services come up constantly. This is because the macro environment is always changing. Technology, marketing trends, what clients want slash need, etc. So it's never too late, air quotes. The game board is evolving every six to 12 months. Good thing to remember. And you've got a bunch of more recent suites uh, that are around uh, similar topics. So uh, what I'd love to do because pr is, is just have you brain dump and we could just talk about productized services, the different styles that you've come across, other ideas, things that you, yeah, just all, the whole thing. Because I, I in my humble opinion, uh, folks who I teach, how to do a variety of things, including value pricing for projects and creating info products and digital goods. Um, the middle piece in the sort of the, the product ladder is usually productized services. I almost always recommend to someone that they have at least one productized service. And honestly, it's the, it's the best of both worlds because they can be much higher ticket. They can be recurring revenue, the, like subscription type stuff. They don't have to be, but they can be. And they're, People are already used to delivering a service, so you're really just packaging up like a product. So it's it's something that I think is really, really good to have in your product ladder. But people are still extremely unfamiliar with them. So I, I, I got the sense that we could have a real, real sort of wide ranging conversations about productized services. So with all that, with all that said, let's start with you. I know the answer to this, but, <laughs> but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, is Testimonial Hero a productized service? So I would say yes. Um, yeah, it, and this is a great question. It's like, how do you sort of define, you know, a productized service? Um, mm -hmm. I think, so My it's my view that, you know, productized services are not, it doesn't have to be a like yes or no thing. It, it's it's sort of like a spectrum of how productized do you, do you want to be, um, which I think mm -hmm. is, good news because then you can, you know, figure out exactly how you want to play the game and, you know, apply it to your own situation. So um, like, so basically, you know, we're definitely a productized service. We have, we solve a very specific problem. We use value-based pricing and, you know, we have a, a clear, you know, price for all of our customers and, you know, the process is exactly the same every single time and we execute it, um, you know, and, and yeah, I think that that is, is the thing. It's like, um, you know, productizing is, is a mindset and it's a spectrum. We are not, you know, probably the, the highest productized in terms of like, you know, other companies, but we're productized at the right level for us. Mm. Okay. That's a great point is that it's, it's more of a spectrum between the two ends. So let me, let me give a brief definition. The definition I use, I'm not saying it's the only one or the only right one, certainly, but the way I describe it, a productized service is that it's a relatively fixed scope service that you offer at a published price on your website. And for, for the people I work with, that's a most useful definition for them to get their heads around it. But as you're pointing out, you can actually play with some stuff in there as short as it is. You could you could have it priced different ways. So so let's talk about that. You said you're, you use value pricing, but do you mean each client that comes through the door is, you know, you're, you're coming up with a custom proposal for them based on what they want? Or did you at one time base a fixed price on uh, sort of aggregate value that for the right kind of client? 
So uh, great question. Um, so all of our pricing is standardized, mm -hmm. but we don't publish it on our website. So that oh, is okay. one, I think the unique thing about us is like, so we, uh, we don't publish our pricing publicly, um, but every all of our customers get the exact same price. Got the it. reason for that is a couple of things. One, you know, we're the most expensive option, um, you know, in general, we're definitely a premium, you know, so we, we want to kind of, um, you know, control that, that price reveal a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, also we found that one of our call to actions, if you go to a good, you know, you'll see an example on our site, you know, if you want to kind of see how we do it, it's uh, testimonialhero.com. Mm -hmm. And we actually, our main call to action is request pricing. Mm -hmm. So, and then we, we, we share the pricing with people right away. Right. So like, mm -hmm. um, but we figured we've realized that like people are happy to, to convert on that. And that we convert a lot of, you know, we get generate a lot of leads like that. So, um, so, so that that's how we do it, I think, uh, for us, and and I think it, it definitely ties back to, you know, a, a lot of things like how differentiated you are, how many other options there are in the marketplace, mm -hmm. how premium you are. Like, if we were one of many people kind of doing what we do, like, we probably wouldn't be a good idea to you know hide our pricing and have to make people request it because there'd be a ton of other you know good options, right? So that's mm -hmm. that's how I think about it. Yeah. And that, it's totally, that's one of the knobs that I would twiddle on a productized service. If I was working for someone, it is, it isn't my default position, but it, uh, it absolutely can make sense. And I think in the exact situation that you just described where you're, it's going to be high, like they're going to gasp a little bit. So you want to control the reveal and make sure that they're not just, you know, skipping over the entire site, looking for dollar signs and be like, oh, that's, that's way too much. And they didn't get a chance to actually, cons you know, like absorb the value proposition. So that's fine. exactly right. Yeah. So, um, if you, so for folks who are listening and the question is, you know, or should I, should, if I was going to create a productized service, should I show the price or not? I would generally default to show it. Uh, I would probably also generally default to not being the most premium, you know, just being super premium if you're just getting started with it. Um, you know, you want to have a nice price that's profitable to you, but usually the way I have people calculate it, you know, I'm talking about a soloist, not somebody who has a big team and, and is going to have a bunch of salaries to worry about. But if you're a soloist and you're an expert at, I don't know, Gatsby, and you want to sell a one-off Gatsby architecture phone call for 500 bucks, just put it on your site. You know, it's, it's, people are going to look at it. They're the, the right buyers are going to say like, oh, that's nothing. That's totally worth this person. You know, this particular go-to person, uh, will save twice as much, 10 times that if, if, um, if we don't step on landmines, those sorts of things, it makes it, it makes the sales process for people who don't have a sales organization or aren't good at sales themselves personally, uh, who want to make it absolutely as easy as possible on themselves. I usually say, just, just put the price. Um, but your, but your scenario, I think is perfectly valid, you know, where you do have people who are going to, uh, who are better at, I love how you say that the price reveal and it indicates interest and yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. And that's a great point about like the, you know, thinking about, you know, the average, you know, price and like, for example, like for us, our average contract value is about 10,000. And like sometimes it's upwards of you know twenty, thirty, forty thousand. So like, and th that just depends on how many pieces people want to buy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like, you know, if you know five hundred, a thousand, couple thousand, it's like, you know, there's a lot. Of, like, I would, I would say, yeah, definitely you know, show that. It's just to add context. We're talking like you know our you know uh, ten thousand up for us. Yeah, it's a kind of, those are kind of numbers that someone can't impulse put on a credit card. You know, they exactly they need to yeah. get it approved. There's going to be, you know, a whole rigmarole with that. Um, oh, I can actually like to talk about that if, if you can for for a higher priced thing like this, that is perhaps going to need to get approval. You know, I see some of the logos on your site are big companies, um, you know, some of the biggest companies, in fact, uh, I imagine that someone people aren't putting this on their credit card, correct? Correct. Yeah. All right. So is there, how much, how much do you have to deal with procurement issues? Um, is there a lot, is that, is that a, 
a big deal for you? Is it, does it drag out the sales process or is it really not a big deal? I'd say medium deal. Um, it's, it certainly can. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, you know, it, it's worth the effort. Um, you know, in, in for us, um, I think the, the main thing is, is less maybe, uh, I think the main thing uh, that I've learned at least for selling, you know, to bigger companies and bigger deals is just the, the different motivations of the, of the buyer mm -hmm. and, and, and how you, you know, need to sort of appeal to that. Um, so like the way I look at it is like, so it's really, uh, and it, it, there's pros and cons and, and challenges, right? So like with us, uh, if you're selling to like a business owner, so if you're like a solo, you know, consultant and you're selling to another, uh, maybe like a founder of a small software company who needs help, you know, building a new, you know, feature of their app, like a, um, you know, you, you, you can kind of drive that deal forward pretty quickly because you're dealing with the person who has the ultimate decision-making power, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> which is great. Um, they also care about, you know, different things and, and ultimately they care about, you know, making their business really successful. And, and, you know, you know, for us, we sell to mostly like mid-level people, like director level. So like mm -hmm. they obviously care about success for their company, but they also care about success for their career. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to some extent, you know, it's, um, it, it's really showing them how, uh, hiring, hiring you is going to, you know, help them, you know, you know, look good internally and make them sure. a star. Sure. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it's, it's in, in the budgets are, are certainly easier because like when you're selling, to, if you're, you know, selling to a small company and you're selling to the owner or the founder, you're kind of like taking like money out of their pocket in, in some senses. Yeah. It's their like, money. That's kind of how they think <laughs> it of feels it. Like yeah. Their it's money. right. Yeah. They think of it like as their kind of personal, you know, personal money. And I, I do the same in a, in a sense. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, it's a small company that we run here. Um, but yeah, a bigger company on the other hand. Um, yeah, it's sometimes harder to, there's multiple decision makers, multiple stakeholders, but they do have like a budget. So that that's the, the nice thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll take, take testimony of the hero off the hot seat for a second here. Um, what, so like, what were you referring to? If we go back to that tweet, uh, when you say, you know, new opportunities for seven figure productized services come up constantly. So what are some other, uh, other sorts of things? Like, how do you see these opportunities? What are you doing when you notice these opportunities? I think, you know, what I kind of meant by that and about new opportunities, you know, coming up is, is really, you know, there's every sort of problem or challenge, you know, in, in the business world is, is a new opportunity and a, you know, that's a new, you know, chance to, to get paid to solve that problem. Right. So like, mm -hmm. for, for example, there's a lot of companies who and in industries who are maybe like behind the trend and right now are re just realizing like, Oh, like video, video matters. And like, you know, video on social is like the new blogs on YouTube in, in, mm -hmm. so, in some respects. Right. So like, then it's like, okay, well, how can I help, you know, financial services industry actually create like, you know, video content that's, you know, compliant with their regulations and, you know, a good process for them and, you know, help them, you know, solve their problems. So mm. two years ago, like they didn't care about that. That wasn't a problem for them because their other bank competitors in the space, like wasn't an issue for them. So point being is like people's, I think people's needs are changing on the client side constantly as the environment changes. And that is a, um, that's an opportunity. And then the other thing is like, it becomes with technology, it, it becomes, um, you know, new, new business models emerge, whether it, like to, I know a lot of your audience is in, um, you know, the software development space. And, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of um, companies popping up related to, you know, software development for, you know, hire a developer in Ukraine, like lemon.io, I think is like a big mm -hmm. one. Like that marketplaces. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Like marketplaces, but very like niche, like even more like, you know, cause basically the things like unbundling basically like, so like they started with like one marketplace and then it's now there's like, a, there's a marketplace for this type of developer in this country, but, you know, so it's like, they're mm -hmm. kind of like unbundling basically like, yeah, it's just always new opportunities being created uh, as the landscape evolves. Cool. I have found that 
a couple of things people will resist when they think of the idea of a productized service, especially when they're used to doing sort of open-ended contract labor types of things where they're just sort of getting paid by the hour, 30 or 40 hours a week by a whale client, let's say, and they're just like, they're just like, they just code, right? They're just like, I build Rails apps or I build React apps or iOS apps or whatever. And they're just like coding, coding, coding. And they think of themselves as a coder. That's one thing. It's like, I, I do Rails apps, I do iOS apps. Uh, and then another thing is they are used to the feeling or they, they are under the impression, perhaps rightly, that scope creep is a constant. It's like a, it's like a law of nature that scope is going to creep on projects. So on the one hand, they think the only thing I can do is my activity, my, my craft. I, all, my only thing that I can do is code. That's the only way to sell my expertise. That's incorrect, but it's, that's usually the starting place. And then when you combine that with, and coding always creeps, like the scope always creeps when I'm coding, then when they hear something like fixed price, they freak out because they're like, oh, that will never work. There's no way for me to fix price a coding project because I don't know how long it will take and the client will drag the scope all over the place. Um, it's, and they can't even imagine the idea of offering some kind of fixed scope service that involves the things that they're used to doing. So how do you, so like you're, you're, these sound kind of like projects. Maybe you could tell me a little bit more about what, a, what it actually entails, but um, you know, the, the activities of the people that are either employed by you or contracted by you, like, how do you keep the scope fixed? You know, is it like a deliverables based outcome? It sounds like you've got a little bit of menu pricing going on where people can pick and choose different things. How do you, make it so that you're not losing money on a gig basically. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's what you said, it, it's menu, menu based and deliverables based. Um, and, you know, in terms of, I think for us, we've, the key to, to, I think par, part of, uh, part of, you know, making sure you don't lose money is, is having done it multiple times or, you know, so many times that, done the same, you know, sort of similar deliverable, um, you know, that, you know, you really know, like all, all the ways that it could be delayed. And, and <laughs> so you can, you can, you know, plan and have contingencies and um, that, that is way easier. Now, not everyone obviously has that luxury, right. And you still might want to productize something you, you've never done before. That's like slightly different. Mm -hmm. In that case, I would say it's not a perfect solution, but it's like just having a really good margin of safety. Mm -hmm. So like if all else fails, like one way you know you think about it is like, if this is like 30 to 40% more work than I think it is, like, am I still like happy with like this, this price? Mm -hmm. um, of course, the more, yeah, the more you do the same thing over and over again, you kind of know, you, you know what it will be, but like when mm -hmm. in doubt, you know, you can always build in a little bit of extra, you know, margin. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have to prove, prove value that, you know, it's worth it, but that's also, you know, part of the, uh, part of the, the whole aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let me just summarize that a little bit. So when you're, when Sam's saying margin of safety, he's talking about charging enough so that there's pro a profit margin, like not just enough to cover the cost, but enough to like cover the cost and hopefully a lot more, you know, maybe, maybe however much it is, as long as it's, as long as the price is still worth it to the customer, they'll pay it. And and then you've got wiggle room in case things go horribly wrong to not lose money on that particular gig. And, uh, and also, even if you did lose money on a particular gig, if you have enough clients, then you've got a different kind of security there because on average, it's not going to go horribly wrong all the time. If you have the other point that Sam made experience doing it over and over again, like there's always going to be some, uh, random occurrence or some, you know, force majeure or something that surprises you <clears throat> but if you've got enough clients and that kind of a thing is an outlier then it won't matter that you maybe even if you lost or barely broke even or even lost money on a particular gig because you've got a hundred other ones that are like a hundred percent profit so i guess what i'm pointing out is is that the profit from any one individual engagement doesn't always have to be amazing as long as you have it enough that that the good projects cover the surprises. You mentioned earlier, um, or maybe I saw this in the Twitter feed. So you, you were talking about whether or not something 
needs to be recurring revenue or MRR or a subscription style productized services. What, um, it sounds like your style is not subscription. Uh, it sounds like, you know, people call basically request prices. You go through the prices, they pick what they want. You do it, you're done. Right. That's yeah. That's basically, that's basically correct. Like, so yeah. So we're selling kind of like consumption based, you know, packages where people can buy, you know, five units of, you know, say like five, you know, videos. And then they, we collect usually upfront on, on all those five videos. And then we, when they're on video four, we kind of, you know, sell another package of five videos. So like, we definitely want to create, you know, we want to maximize LTV, like lifetime value mm -hmm. of the customer. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we definitely want to, you know, make sure we have, you know, repeat purchases, but we, we, we're, we're not obsessed with like, you know, quote unquote, monthly recurring revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, or we're, and we're not obsessed with locking people into a subscription, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly because for us, like a sub monthly subscription isn't really a fit for our service. And, and I mean, that is, that is the, the real key is I think a lot of people have this idea that like, um, well, yeah, there's a lot of kind of misconceptions, but I think a lot of people have this idea that like if they they can get um, uh, monthly recurring revenue, it's going to be more predictable. And but the thing is, like that's not that's not always true for a number of reasons, which which we can get into. But and the the other real negative is you know it, a lot of times you know you're in the situation where like someone wants monthly recurring revenue, but it's not a, a monthly recurring revenue service. So like in actuality, like it would be better. It's not like an ongoing like thing mm. that it's going to happen for like 12 months. Right. So like really they end up doing some work for three or four months together. The payment gets spread out over three to four months. And instead of collecting a hundred percent upfront on day one and having that cash flow to reinvest in, you know, marketing and pay themselves and pay their team and, or pay their contractors, they just effectively put their, um, gave their customers like a financing option and <laughs> it didn't benefit them at all. And, and, yeah. but they, but they, they do it because I mean, people do it because they think, Oh, monthly recurring revenue. It sounds so nice, but like it reality is like, it can really mess up your cash flow. And it, and if you're, if you don't have something that's like, if you're not honest with yourself and like, that, like, is this something that's going to be like six, eight, 12 months, like on a, a good, you know, really sticky service. It's like, well, if it's only going to be three or four or five months, it's like, you might as well just charge up front for it and collect it all yeah. at once. Yeah. So I, I, I agree. I couldn't agree more with your point about some services are just not a fit for recurring. It just doesn't make sense. So like, just to, like yours is a great example. Like I can't, it's hard for me to imagine, I guess maybe if the company was huge or something, or they've got some new initiative and they know they need that, you know, they're going to want a thousand videos and they just want you on kind of on a retainer, just like make, keep making them. Give us five a month until we tell you to stop. You know, may, I could imagine that deal, but you could just broker that deal if you wanted to. It it would be weird. It seems weird to me that some director would need essentially uh, a spigot of videos, an unending flow of video testimonials. It's like they'd run out of customers or employees or like at some point, it just seems like it would be a weird fit. It'd be like you trying to shoehorn a business model uh, onto it that, doesn't make sense on exactly the other hand, right. Yeah. So on the other hand, and a, a great example of ongoing deliverable based monthly productized service would be something like podcast production, podcast editing, because if, if you start a podcast, it kind of by default, you know, most people don't think, Oh, I'm just going to do like 20 episodes and that's it. It's just going to be every week. We just go every week until we get sick of it. It could last for five years. Who knows? Uh, and and I want someone who I, I don't need to make a purchasing decision every month or every episode. I just want to pay X dollars per month and drop my raw files into a Dropbox folder and have somebody take it from there, edit it, clean it, everything up, upload it to the site, do the show notes. It's like an ongoing thing. It's almost like um, it's almost like something you, you could theoretically just hire an employee to do because it's never going to go away uh, and, until the podcast stops, in which case you just cancel it. Um, so that, I mean, that's an example of a, a style of service or a need that makes way more sense for that kind of thing, because the buyer just doesn't want to make that purchase decision constantly over and over again, and like arrange the details and have all the back and forth. So it takes all that friction out 
and it makes it easier. It makes it easier for for the podcaster to just do what they're good at and then forget about it and make and just know that everything's done. Very true. And I think yeah, another you know example of that would be like other examples would be like pay per click Google Ads companies, right? Definitely, you know, something you're going to need, you know, monthly runs on a true monthly cadence and like any sort of like, I mean, a lot of blog content. Um, that being said, I, I do think, you know, even, um, even in those cases, if you can get people to pay upfront for as much as possible, it's still obviously beneficial. It's, it's extremely beneficial, right? So like, it, you know, if, if it's like a podcast thing, it's like, if you can get them to pay quarterly, in you know or even like upfront for a year that would be very hard but like you know maybe it's possible right um that, that's that's just way better i think what what frustrates me is when i see people going like when people are thinking that mrr is better than like collecting upfront annually or collecting upfront quarterly because like there's nothing special about mrr it actually is like worse for your cash flow like you're delaying your, you know, you're delaying the time that you, and like having that money and being able to use it. So it's like, yeah, like whenever possible, like, I mean, MRR, like even if it's a subscription and it should be a subscription, it's like, see if you can get it quarterly, see if you can get it annually. And obviously like it makes sense, but I think it's like this sort of like Twitter meme of like everyone, you know, posts their quote unquote, like MRR. So like people are like, well, like I'm going to do MRR so I can have MRR, but like <laughs> you really don't want MRR unless you have to have it. You'd rather have annual ARR, you know, and then quarterly if possible. And yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, uh, I don't agree in a hundred percent of cases with that, but, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, but I do, I, I do completely appreciate what you're saying. And in fact, John Marlow, who wrote The Automatic Customer, uh, which is about subscription-based businesses, he agrees with you 100%. And, uh, but I do think there are scenarios where it kind of doesn't matter. And it, maybe it's even worse. But so I'll, mm. I'll describe, I'll describe Warlow's point because he's really an expert's expert on this. And his point is, especially for businesses that have a really high customer acquisition cost, that that which means you know somebody is spending you know company is let's say i don't know um hubspot or something like that or like slack or salesforce let's say that they are spending millions of dollars every month in like pay-per-click advertising and seo and whatever they're spending loads and they're bringing in x number of new customers every month and you know, and it, and it works out that they have to spend about 500 bucks to get one new HubSpot user. Uh, if that HubSpot user is going to be on a free, let's, let's not even do that. So like if that HubSpot user is going to be on a $9 a month plan and they spent $500 to get her, then it's going to be a while before they recoup their investment in getting that person. And they could churn before, you know, like, but if they, but if HubSpot gets that person to to pay for a, you know, an annual thing that I guess my math doesn't work out that great. But if, if the annual would pay back, if the annual payment is higher than the customer acquisition cost, then you could just do that all day because you don't have to recoup your losses before you, like you've got fresh money every day. So like, exactly. so I, you know, I'm HubSpot. I spend 500 bucks to get, you know, Sam to join and Sam pays 700 bucks for a year. Now they've got, They've got 700 bucks, you know, that to spend another 500 and keep 200, you know, without having, there's, there's no, uh, it's not, uh, what's the, I'm, I'm like telescoped. It's not telescoped out over a year. And so they don't have to borrow money or get investors to keep acquiring users so that, you know, you kind of like not, you don't have to borrow money from Peter to pay Paul. You got all the money exactly, right up front. Yeah. Right. So when doesn't annual matter. It doesn't matter if you have no customer acquisition costs, which, which one might think is not a reality. Uh, but you know, for people that I work with, it's not that uncommon for them to have no customer acquisition cost or no meaningful customer acquisition cost Cause they're not, they, they, they're not paying for stuff to, you know, they're not paying for ads. They're not paying for VAs to go do stuff. They're not paying for outreach. It's more like a word of mouth, very new 
sort of thing. Maybe once you get to a scale phase, then it's a totally, totally different story. But at a seed stage, I meet plenty of people who do not have really any meaningful customer acquisition cost beyond what they're already doing for their regular business. So they're speaking at conferences, they're doing podcasts and they're you know, doing things like you're doing right now. I mean, you could call this a cost because you know, you're spending your time to talk to me, but uh, it would be tough to directly map that to like, oh, and I got 10 users from it or 20 users from it. So was it worth my, or I got no users from it. Uh, but at any rate, you're not, um, you're not, you, there's no money for you to recoup here. Right. So yeah, that's a, that's a great distinction. Um, and totally agree. Like with, you know, your first point around, like, it's like the term that I hear tossed around is like the CAC payback period. So like that, that customer acquisition cost payback period. And mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Like you said, like, you can just, you can recoup that so much faster when you're collecting, you know, more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Another way, I, I guess an easier way, the way I should have said it was if the monthly, the first monthly payment covers your customer acquisition cost, then who cares? <laughs> it's like, fine. You know? So it, it, true. Yeah. But normally in the normal, like big SaaS scenario, or even, even mediums, anybody who's paying a lot for advertising, basically, in, in related activities, um, you know, maybe they're paying, I, I actually know a dev shop that's paying, you know, thousands of dollars per month of just like content for content people to just blog. And it's like, okay, that's expensive. You know, you want that to, you want that to map to uh, income. They're not, they're not a productized mm -hmm. service. But the point is you can spend a lot of money acquiring customers. And if you do, then getting the biggest possible payment you can from them is pretty important. That's when that becomes really important. For uh, sure. And the last thing I'll just say on this is like, you can, if you are, if you do, you know, shift to more of a collecting upfront or just collecting more in advance, you know, quarterly, annually, it can unlock new options for marketing, you know, uh, that, that just aren't possible otherwise. So you, like you said, like there's just some, you know, some things, um, you know, the math just doesn't work out for some things, you know, unless you are collecting in a more upfront basis. And if you don't want to do any of those things, like that's not a problem. It doesn't matter. Right. But if, if there's certain new things you want to do, then, you know, that's when it might make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Another thing to think about is productized services. It, it does make, depending on your business, like a, a recurring model might make sense or it might not make sense. Can you, in your travels, have you come across other examples of that are sort of the non-recurring kind where it's productized, it's going to be more or less a, a one-time thing. Maybe you'll get repeat business, maybe you're, or, or maybe what you're hoping for is word of mouth. Like are there, are there uh, businesses that you, off the top of your head that either you use or you're aware of that have this kind of like more or less a one and done model? A lot of the services we use are like to extend our, our employee, like, but content, like we have an ad agency, content agency. So yeah, nothing, nothing is, is coming off the top of my head. Yeah. I've, I've got my, one of my favorite examples. Uh, why am I spacing? Oh, knapsack creative. So like the one, the one that I always use as an example of a one and done is knapsack creative. They build a website in a day. They build you a Squarespace site in a day that you will be proud to show off to your potential clients, family, friends, and so forth. And they've got it down to a science where they're just like, they have you do some homework. They've got this intake system. It's genius. Uh, mm. And then they, you know, you don't need a new website every day though, <laughs> you know? So there's no, but, but what do you need? So they, they have a, a little hybrid model kind of where they, it's mid four figures to get your website done, but it's done like, boom, it's beautiful. And it has all the things that you'd want, you know, you just get for free with Squarespace, like secure, fast, mobile friendly, so forth. And, and then what is the thing that you probably do need though? You, you might need updates or main, not maintenance, but like, like tweaks or a new page or add a service offering or something. And, and you're, you're not great at Squarespace. So they have, they do have like a support model that is subscription, which does make sense because you're probably going to need to make some changes over time on a, you know, more or less regular basis to your site. So, you know, it's like 50 bucks a month is nothing. And the, you know, for that amount of money, they'll go in and do certain amount of stuff. And then they have that based, uh, that's like the scope is controlled on that by the amount of time that they'll work on it. Uh, I think the kinds of things that they'll do, and there's some things that are out of bounds. If, you know, if you want that, then that's either a new website or a different conversation, or they've got different pricing for it. I'm not sure, but 
Yeah, so they kind of do both things where the, the idea of having somebody building a website for you that is the kind of thing you only need done like, you know, no more than once a year, probably, hopefully. <laughs> um, it wouldn't make sense to try and shoehorn that into a subscription model. But the thing that, but then they're like the maintenance, you know, people were like, oh, but now I need to update it. Now I need to update it. And like, well, let's just create this subscription. We'll do updates for air quotes free as long as you're a, a $50 a month member. So that's a classic one. Um, I love that example. I'm on their site right now. Super slick. And yeah, that's such a, that's a great example of it. It doesn't have to be an either or, right? It can be, it could be both. Right. Yeah. It's like whatever is the most, uh, the best fit and whatever's yeah. best for the customer. Right. Cause again, it's like, you don't want to have to make a new buying decision every time. You're like, Oh, I really want to add a service to the navigation, but I can't figure out how to do it. And I don't really want to bother Ben over there and such a small chain. You know, it's like none of that. You just, they just like, like, I don't know if it's send an email or whatever, but it's just like, here you go. Boom, do it done. Great. Thanks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. hundred percent. And I, I think like for what it's worth, I think part of my kind of, you know, I guess passion for kind of evangelizing more options outside of, you know, subscriptions. I'll tell you, I guess a little backstory, just to add a little context is um, so like after, so I, I had a, you know, ran a, pretty traditional agency in my early twenties. I'm 32 now. And you know, so for, like the first half of my twenties, like I ran this pretty traditional full service video ag agency. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I, you know, basically, you know, uh, fast forward a few years, I uh, wasn't doing that anymore. And I wanted to start another company and I, I kind of had been, you know, some, maybe like somewhat like burned or scarred from that. And I, I thought like, recurring revenue is like the answer. Like that's going to solve all my problems. And I, I think that's a really common thing. And like, honestly, like it's kind of a, something that's perpetuated, I think, uh, in, yeah, in, you know, in, and so I, I kind of thought I was like, Oh, recurring revenue is the answer. Like, but it's just, so like, I, I basically sat on testimonial hero, like for a year, like not really taking it seriously mm -hmm. because I really didn't believe in it because I didn't think that I could, make a business work like because i didn't think it was worth it effectively and like the reason i'm passionate and like fast forward now um i've been doing it for i guess like four four years or so i mean we're we're approaching three million in revenue this year and it's and i mean i just bought a house had a baby and none none of our and guess what we don't have any mrr and so like it's, it's doable this is my point like you don't need to like don't what don't think like if anyone's listening to this and they, they're just holding back because it doesn't fit into the perfect subscription business model like you can figure it out and and it, it can still be a really good business and like and maybe you'll figure it out you know and, and maybe we will add like subscription revenue but like I, I was i was so like had so much like parallel uh, i was paralyzed by inaction because mm -hmm. like i had all a lot of the stuff i was reading is like you need recurring revenue you need or you're blah 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 so like and i believed in and and like, and so, yeah, that's, that's really where I'm coming from is like, I want to encourage people that like, you know, it, you can make it work regardless. There's other ways to create predictability, um, other than just like your quote unquote billing model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I love that story. It's like, you're paralyzed by the like, wait, I, here's what I'm good at. Here's where I have experience. Here's the thing I could productize, but it doesn't fit into this model that everyone says I need. It's like, well, okay, just use, use a different model. Um, while you were talking about that, it, the, the, something about that triggered a memory where I, I interviewed someone for the book I'm working on is it's going to have a bunch of productized services up in it. And she was a designer. So sort of an agency background like you, and she was doing, um, she wasn't a photographer, but she taught herself. She sort of self-taught, became a self-taught photographer and started doing that as her main thing. And she like left the kind of left the agency world, wanted to just focus on, on doing photography. So she geared up and all that and found it very difficult. I, you know, there's lots of photographers listening. I know I've talked to many of them. Uh, it's a lot of competition. Everybody's got an iPhone and so forth. So it's, it's kind of tough to just be a freelance photographer. And, and I don't, I'll have to go back and, and well, I guess you can buy the book when it comes up, but I don't remember exactly what, how this occurred to her, but what she did was, um, she took, she had a, a very, a, like a very noticeable or distinct style. It was very sort of, um, uh, she shot the kind of photos that one would use on like a lifestyle, 
kind of home decor sort of sort of blog or something like that and or you see on somebody's instagram so she ended up she just like would would take a bunch of pictures and she created kind of like a stock photography for female entrepreneurs kind of membership where you know i mean there's tons of stock photography site but sites but this was so niche that you could go in and she would release like a new crop of photos from a shoot and they all matched like you didn't have to pick and choose and like find something that that was that was right for you and then find another one and like oh geez i wish it was flipped the other way and and you're just combing through all of this stuff that mostly is a bad fit and to find like a needle in a haystack but if you are one of these like sort of female entrepreneurs and you know hers her words not mine um, where you could just sign up and for i don't know 50 bucks a month or whatever just have unlimited use to all of her photography that all matched it was all kind of in your vibe and then periodically she would release a new a new set a new photo set that was whatever you know whatever it was like whatever if there's something new or trendy or hip or things that people were requesting like boy i wish there were more flowers or whatever the case may be she just could shoot it and then add it to the thing. And then so the, the members would just continually have access to and the rights to use the photography on their sites. And if they stopped paying her, they stopped getting the rights to use the photography on their on their sites. If I think I remember that correctly. So it made it really sticky. Uh, and it might not have been 50 bucks a month. It might be $9 a month. And and as a member, you're allowed to use all of photography as much as you want, as long as you're a member. I'm like, wow, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, that, that that's set, it's an awesome example, and I think you know coming back to the the my uh, kind of tweet we talked about earlier about like the changing environments. I think like what I maybe we can underscore there about like is like she saw that like things were changing in her audience, like people were doing more blogging, doing more of their own web design. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure Instagram. like in Instagram, like you know m more visual aspects of social media and they just they then they needed this uh this type of content and she sort of solved the problem and yeah this, love that example yeah yeah in fact i think that might be i think that might have been what happened i think she was trying to do her own website for photography or or her maybe when she was still doing design and she couldn't find you know she's going to like iStock photo or or unsplash or whatever and just like couldn't find anything you know or couldn't find enough and so that, I think that might've been when she just, she's like, well, I'll just shoot it myself. And then after that, she was like, I wonder if other people like me have the same problem. And she asked around and sure enough, they did. So, yeah, I mean, she got, um, it's been a while since I talked to her, but I seem to recall that she was at the point in her business, it was still a little bit early on, but she was at the point where she had enough um, stability in the cash flow that she stopped shooting the photography and started hiring photographers to do it for her, but just kind of to her, style so that it would all fit in together so it's it was it was mm. doing really well for the last time we talked so there's one idea for you photographers you could do one for tattoo artists or something you know for whatever you're into yeah well while we're, while we're on the photographer thing i think you know one thing that can be a good like creative exercise is like you know kind is like what we just kind of talked about like unbundling so like go to mm. like what's working and then just make a more niche version of version of it right that is great that's a great way to think about it yeah i, I don't never articulate articulated it like that but that's a really good idea even going on like fiverr and like go so like go go to fiverr go to the photography category of fiverr see what's popular and then pick what you like and turn it make a premium version of it not the five dollar version of it right so that's <laughs> yeah yeah I've never done that, but that is a really compelling idea. That's a good hypothesis. That, that could certainly work for someone. Hmm, cool. So I'm trying to think of some other productized services that have, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that I offer that I would consider productized services. Me and people like me, um, you know, my sort of one-off coaching call is the, that's the easiest no-brainer, get out of jail free path into productized services for most of the people I work with, where they've got you know, five, 10 years of expertise into a particular discipline and uh, people would be happy to pick their brain about stuff. And in fact, um, when they do project work, a lot of the beginning of the engagement really is sort of like a, a diagnostic kind of, you know, where they, they, they need to inspect the patient, so to speak, and find out like, where does it hurt? What's wrong? Okay. What do you want instead? What would be the transformation? And they do this kind of upfront thing. You know, in the past, they probably did it by the hour or they did it for free in the sales process. 
But anyway, they, they're recognized as good at what they do. And p p if you're recognized as the go-to person for a particular thing and uh, your buyers care about that, they'll, they'll spend $200, $500, $1,000 to jump on a phone call with you and get private, one-on-one, -on -one, direct from the horse's mouth advice about, you know, what would you do if you were in their situation, given the, you know, all the uncertainty that they're facing. You know, we wanted to get the guy that wrote the book or the gal that wrote the book about this topic. And they go to your website and they say, oh, for 500 bucks, I can just jump on a phone call and I can book it for like next Friday. <laughs> Sign me up. And like, I, I would consider that, I think it's fair to consider that a productized service. It's obviously not recurring. It's a one-time thing, but it's so easy to set up that it's kind of like the, for me, it's kind of like the gateway drug into productized services uh, because it's it's inherently fixed scope. Um, it's really, in, even with mine now, I just, I, I'm like, I offer a money back guarantee. Like if we get to the end of the call and you didn't feel like it was worth the money, I'll just give it back to you. And kind of like our conversation earlier with, um, with you know, occasionally if you have something go sideways, if you have enough margin, then it's fine. It's like, it's not your favorite, but it's not going to put you out of business either. Uh, with me, it's like if somebody wanted their money back, it would, I'd be happy to do it. And, and I wouldn't feel like I lost money on that call because overall I've never had to do that. So, so like the profit that I've gotten from all the previous ones would kind of like, Oh geez, there was like for some reason an outlier or this person really wasn't ready to have this conversation. I probably should have filtered them out. You know, if something like that did happen, it's like, it's, it's no big deal because of the profit that is built into the thing from the other, um, not engagements is too small to call it an engagement, but like the other calls is like that makes up for it. So on balance across the whole experience of the product, you know, it's wildly profitable. hundred percent. And I mean, I, a couple of years ago, we, when we were talking before the call, a couple of years ago, I, I signed up for, you know, one of those calls and yeah. I got a ton of value out of it. And, um, and so that's, I mean, that's a perfect example. And, um, yeah, I, I, to me, I, there's, I also think about like, you know, if I'm going to underscore anything there, it would be, it's like, is it easy to buy? Does it like help me purchase? And it's like, is it like clear? And also it's like, is it something I can market to? Mm -hmm. Um, cause like for me, like the, and I've been on both sides of the fence, it's like, it's really hard to market generalism. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't like, you know, you can't, you just can't market it very well. It's hard to create like demand for a situation where you, um, and you kind of, you know, need to talk to someone to understand the problems, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, solve them. But like, if you, if you have just a specific, here's what we can do for you, you have your value proposition and like, here's what you'll get. And then you can, you can a make it, you know, really easy to, to buy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you can promote it. Um, yeah. and yeah, that's the product part. That's like, that's why exactly. that's the, yeah. it's, it's got a package. Exactly. You know, exactly. it's, it's got a label on the front, it's got ingredients on the back, uh, the benefits are on the front label and the fine print is, <laughs> is less important. So they put it on the back. Um, so yeah, I mean, just imagine like if you were, you know, Sam Shepler videographer, need a video, I can do video, let you tell me what you need. It's kind of like, how do you sell that? It's like, you know, what, you know, and if, if you were at that stage of the game where you, that's all you did, you're just a generalist with a video camera then it would be like, like, what are the benefits of video? And it's like, well, there's all kinds of benefits of video. Some people use them like this. Other people use them like that. Other people are using them some other way. Like, do any of those sound like things you could, like, there's no, nothing to talk about. There's no, it's like your buyer needs to know that they need video. They need to know, and, and the odds of it being high enough value for some rando like that are pretty low, you know, for you to, to make like a comfortable living, which is why generalists, especially that, that would you'd consider freelance type people, but they can't make any money. They're like, they're like, how come, you know, geez, I'm not getting paid fairly for my expertise or my work. You know, I'm not getting paid fairly for my work. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's not the customer's fault. In my opinion, it's not the customer's fault. It's like get better customers. You know, they're not going to magically mm -hmm. show up. And it's easier, to your point, it's easier to get better customers if you p pick one. So like I, I, on my mailing list, when somebody joins my mailing list, one of the first things it says is like, 
what would be success for your business? Like, what does that look like for you? And like nine times out of 10, one of the things in that answer is kind of like better customers or working with customers who value what I do or respect me or something like that, almost always. And I'll say like, like, okay, what kind of better customers? Like, what, what would your ideal customer look like? And, and like nine out of 10 of them are like, I don't know, right? Like at what kind of businesses benefit the most from what you do? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that might be why you're not attracting them. You know, it's like you're putting, it's like you're, you're putting no bait on the hook. You know, there's no, there's nothing there that the fish are interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's such a good point. And, um, and I've been, like I said, I've been in both places. I, to be fair, I think I, I also had to do a lot of exploring, you know, before I did, you know, exploited the, the sort of the product I service. Right. So I think yeah. that that's also a good thing to remember for people listening is like, you know, it's okay. Like it's okay. It may be okay to be a generalist, you know, for a little while as you figure out what you want to productize. And like, um, it's, it's just like, you know, at least my, my opinion on it is like, you just want to be intentional about like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So like, if, if you want to be a generalist for the next, you know, six months or the next year, and, you know, obviously definitely, you know, should be, you, you should use all, everything and, you know, you know, um, you know, your pricing strategies, uh, Jonathan, like those are obviously like, don't, don't ever do hourly. Hourly is nuts. <laughs> uh, but like, there is like, you can do still do, you know, uh, value pricing and, and a slightly more generalist approach. And then you, you sort of maybe in that experience, you've in that, at least that wasn't for me. Like I didn't, I learned in my, my generalist agency, that was where I got the insights around like, aha, like people are very happy with testimonials. Mm -hmm. This would be worth productizing. So like it, it wasn't something like I had to kind of unlock that insight by paying the, the generalist price for, mm -hmm you know, a couple of years, honestly. So like, yeah. um, so yeah, so that I think is, it's like that explore, exploit, you know, kind of like paradigm where there, there's time to kind of where you need to explore. And then, then eventually you need to, you know, exploit what you've learned and whatnot. Yeah, totally agree. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually reading a book right now called range. And the premise of the book is, you know, I, I'm just a couple of chapters into it, but the premise of the book basically is like, you know, specialization, or here's the impression that I had of the book before I started reading it. Specialization is dumb, generalism is where it's at. And I was like, okay, and, and people had been sending it to me or telling me about it because I'm always beating the opposite drum. But come to find out, you know, in the book, all he's really saying is specialize later. Don't start out, don't, don't have your three-year-old taking chess lessons. You know, he's, it's kind of like more, it's more like anti, uh, what was it, Tiger Mom or whatever that was? <laughs> Or am mm -hmm. I thinking of Tiger King? It's like, it's just anti um, single tracking your kids from nursery school on. I'm like, mm. yeah, I can get behind that 100%. But it, it's not anti specializing. It's like, let them explore and then they'll come to it. And when they're ready, they'll special, like when they see the opportunity, they'll, they'll recognize it. And it's like, okay, this is what I want to do now. And I mean, it was almost comical to me at the, in the intro of the book, he's using Tiger Woods as a failed example of specialization. I'm like, mm. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can get behind that. Um, but then, then it, you know, as the book started to reveal itself to me, I was like, oh, he's just talking about specializing later. Like you still need to do mm. it. Right. And so that's exactly your point. You know, it's like, and, and I agree with it. I agree with both the book and your point, which is like, yeah, if you don't know what to do, like, if you don't know what you want to do, if you don't know who you want to help, if you don't know what you like, then yeah, I'm just throwing a dart at a board just to specialize just because you heard somebody on a podcast talk about it. That's doomed to fail. You're either going to not like it and it's not going to work or you're going to not like it and it is going to work and then you'll be trapped in a job you don't even like. <laughs> so that, that's got lots of ways that it could go wrong. But once you, like, you recognize the opportunity, you're like, oh, you know what? The reactions I'm getting when I do this kind of work are, you know, and the testimonials that I'm getting about doing these videos for people are just like, whoa, you know, this is, this is, um, they perceive it as high value. They see it as contributing to their bottom line in some way. And it's super important for probably certain kinds of businesses. And so you're like, oh, all right. I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I mean, I'm sort of paraphrasing what you said, but yeah, it's the same with, it's the same with other, you know, like, um, I'm trying to think like with my students, what kind of productized services do they gravitate to? There's all different ones. I would call training in workshops a specialized kind of productized service. It's fixed scope published at a, at a fixed price on your website, you know, 
um, uh, advisory retainers, open-ended subscription service to your expertise. That's a very common one. Um, design sprints, a sort of one-off five-day design sprint, like Google Venture style design sprints for X dollars. And if you need another one, call us, we'll do another one for a new feature or new release. Yeah, there's just tons of them. So not really, no question there, just sort of like, sort of like, yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the whole point of productized service is that they're just so much easier to sell. You can position them, you can have, you can know what the benefits are, you can pick a ideal buyer for this particular thing. It just makes it so much easier. So if you, if you don't like doing sales or you're not good at it or you don't want to get good at it, then productized services are a great way to go because it's much more likely that they can sell themselves. Would you, would you agree with that? I couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right, cool. Is there any stone we left unturned? No, I think, um, I think we covered everything, honestly, like maybe we, we do a round two sometime, but, uh, I think mm-hmm. we, we got all, we covered a lot there. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, I mean, my, my real goal, I think for this episode was for people to certainly understand like the definition of the term, understand why it would be good for them. And then uh, try to come up with like some examples that would maybe be kick loose, um, something that's staring you right in the face. So like the dear listener, maybe something staring you right in the face, but you never thought about selling your brains instead of your hands. Uh, maybe one of these examples is like, oh, I could do that in my world. Like I'm not a photographer, but I'm an illustrator and I could kind of do the same thing. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, but you know, let me know on Twitter if you, uh, it, what you thought, if you've got other ideas, I'm sure it, we've got other, a million other ideas that we didn't even come up with. Yeah, that'd be great. Sam, where can people go to find out more about you? Is it just Testimonial Hero? Uh, yeah, why don't you share that URL again and your Twitter? Yeah, for sure. So it's um, testimonialhero.com for any, you know, if you want to see what we're up to, get any inspiration. Uh, and then uh, best place to um, get in touch with me or kind of follow my latest, you know, thoughts or rants around productized services um, is uh, is Twitter for sure. And it's just... Uh, at Sam Shepler and uh, Shepler is S H E P L E R. So at Sam Shepler on Twitter. Cool. Well, thanks for, again for joining me, Sam. My pleasure, Jonathan. All right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and I hope you join me again next time for Ditching Hourly. Bye.